In this video, we will discuss Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Kepler derived these laws some time before Newton, but back then they were not widely accepted until Newton himself derived these laws from his law of gravitation. Kepler's laws are as follows. The first law says that the orbit of a planet is an ellipse with the Sun at one of its two focus points. The second law states that the line segment joining a planet and the Sun sweeps out equal areas during equal time intervals. The third law states that the square of the orbital period of a planet is directly proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. Now I suppose this might not tell you much if you're not a physicist, so in this video we will try to illustrate these laws in more understandable ways. Let's start with the first law and break it down. The statement is, the orbit of a planet is an ellipse with the Sun at one of its two focus points. Kepler was the first to realize that planets orbit in ellipses and not in circles. But note that a circle is just a special case of an ellipse. So what his law states is that the orbit of a planet is an ellipse. Ellipses have two focus points or foci, and these points help to define the ellipse. Now, the law simply states that at one of these points the Sun must be, and at the other point there is nothing in space, it's just a geometric point. Mathematically, the law can be written as r is equal to p over 1 plus epsilon cosine theta, where r is the radius of the orbit, e is the eccentricity, which is just a number between 0 and 1, and one can think of the eccentricity as a measure of how much the orbit deviates from being circular, so the bigger the number, the less it would look like a circle. So if r is 0, it's just a special case where the ellipse is just like a circle, and one can then see that the formula reduces to r is equal to p, thus a circle with radius p. More generally, p is called the semi-lattice rectum, which might sound fancy, but it can quite easily be understood with an example. If one makes a drawing of an ellipsis, then p is just the line orthogonal to the line from the center on one of the focus points. Thus, when we consider the formula, we see how the radius changes with the angle theta, which is just how many degrees one goes around the orbit, and one orbit is then 360 degrees. The second law states, a line segment joining a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas during equal time intervals. Now this is related to the fact that the bigger the radius, thus the farther the object is from the other object it's orbiting, the slower it moves. Likewise, when a radius is small, which is when the object is close to the ob object it's orbiting, then the object moves faster. Because of this relation between the radius and the velocity, then if you consider a slice of the orbit covered during some time t, when r is small, and a slice of the orbit covered during some time t, which is the same time t, but when r is big, then the area covered is the same. And this is the essence of Kepler's second law. The third law states, the square of the orbital period of a planet is directly proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of the orbit. This law relates the orbital periods of planets to the distance to the Sun. And generally, it makes more sense if you write it as an equation and not in terms of words. So let's denote the orbital period as t in the semi-major axis as a and write it as the following equation t squared is proportional to a cubed. We use the proportional sign since Kepler didn't, didn't manage to derive the exact equation. The semi-major axis a is just the longest possible distance from the center of the ellipse to the edge of the orbit. With the help of Newton's law of gravitation, it became possible to find the exact formula of Kepler's third law. So now we can drop the proportionality sign and write it as a cubed is equal to g t squared times the sum of masses divided by 4 pi squared. And note that g is just the gravitational constant, the big m is the mass of the sun, and the small m is the mass of the planet that is orbiting the sun. It should be clear from this that using Kepler's laws, one can describe our solar system quite well. With this, let's conclude this video, and now we have seen some rather simple physics that can achieve quite a lot. 
So I propose that we end this line of videos by combining the physics we have discussed in relation to gravity and planetary motion and then use this to discuss how Newtonian mechanics can describe our solar system very well. As always, I hope you learned something new and feel free to comment on what you like and would like to see in the future. If I missed something, uh, please press like if you like it and subscribe for more. See you next time, so stay tuned.